this meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission on October 28th. Um, first thing on our agenda is to uh, approve the agenda. And everyone take a look. I'll move to approve the agenda. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. The agenda is deemed approved. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is the comments from the chair. Uh, the only comments I have is that, you know, it's been a little while since we've met. So just as a reminder, we'll, we'll probably, as far as the timeline in the near future for our meetings, uh, we'll probably vote on the regulations we'll be discussing tonight and on the map we'll be discussing tonight at next meeting. Uh, so that everyone's aware of that. Um, and then at the meetings after that, we're going to uh, tackle the city plan and we'll probably start trying to do maybe about three chapters a meeting uh, from then on, be kind of the ambitious plan. Uh, we'll be looking at the information we get from the committee. So that we are going to get information from committee set fast. Mike's been gathering it. He's, he has some. I think we have enough at least for one meeting already, right? Yeah, we'll have enough for one. It might take us a couple meetings to get through those, but we can at least get those rolling for the implementation plans. Are you including the energy one? I have not. I've got to meet with you guys, probably your subcommittee, to oh, see okay. where you guys are at. All right. Revise it in, in light of our MPG grant application discussion. It kind of helps to narrow down the scope of it, actually makes it easier. Okay, good. That's, uh, that's all I have for the comments. Uh, so the next on the agenda is general business. And uh, I don't believe we have any members of the public here. All of the folks in attendance are from the Historic Preservation Committee. Uh, is committee, right? Or the commission? Historic Preservation Commission and then Design Review Committee. Okay, so that's easy to keep track of. Uh, <laughs> all right, so it looks like other... Uh, officials are in the audience, so it doesn't look like we have any general business. Uh, so the next on the, our agenda is to consider the minutes. So it's another housekeeping matter to, to move through. So if folks can take a look at the September 23rd minutes. Let us know. If, uh, I just have a quick question. Um, so at the bottom of the minutes, I wanted to ask about this anyway, but I was reminded there was, we did talk at the last meeting at the end about like potentially like having like a working session. I just wanted to make sure nothing happened in between this last like Correct. last meeting and this right. one, right? Okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't like left That's out. That's a good of question. The, I had assumed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So perfect. Did, did you have a quorum? We did at that last meeting, yeah. Okay. Right? September twenty third. Yeah. Okay. But but as far as early October, there I don't there was not a meeting. No, Is that right? Yeah, because there was a holiday and then we had thought like oh maybe we'll get together for a working session right. the week before but then nothing ever materialized and I wanted to make sure that that was in fact what what happened and I think our next meeting is a holiday too, so just, uh, is it again? The do we want to talk about that real quick what's the 11 what holiday it's is that veterans. 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 Oh. will you be here Mike uh, usually that's a holiday for the city. It is. There's no the city's oh. <coughs> Next year, by the way, almost all the holidays are on different weeks. So <laughs> no. This year was a particularly bad one for so, every holiday for landing the on okay. the planning <laughs> so, commission meeting. So dealing with this real quick, and we can, we can take it back up at the end maybe, but uh, if people need to think about it, could we meet on the Tuesday? Would that conflict with anyone, the Tuesday after? So so we're we're going to need Mike because it's going to go over the city plan material. So we're going to shoot for November 12th instead. That works for me. Um, just That's fine. Does anyone know off the top when the city or PCP It'll be the second Tuesday, so it would conflict for you. Okay. I think. I can't tell. I need to get back to the Second Tuesday. I don't know, I'll have, to, I'll have to check on the availability of this room and whether or not it'll be recorded or not. So we'll have to, I'll have to query a few things to make sure. Would it be better to put us on a different Monday? Uh, the other Mondays are all occupied by DRB. Yeah, DRB. 
right? PRB. Unless you're not you having a meeting. Uh, we're having, as far as I know, we're having DRC still. Okay. DRB, we aren't having a But that's later, yeah, so that's that doesn't later. really help us. Okay, well, I'll, I'll double check whether the 12th, how available that is. Do we need to post notice for it? Yeah, I would just put notices out early. Okay, so it's not too late to no. do that? Nope. Okay. Uh, so let's tentatively plan to meet at the same time on the Tuesday instead. And then if Mike tells us otherwise, we might have to audible. And Marcella, you could choose to come for the beginning or, um, or not. Okay. So that brings us to. We didn't. I don't think we, we didn't vote, minutes. did we, on the minutes? No, we didn't. Sorry. Oh, do we have a do we have a motion to approve minutes? Or any more feedback on the minutes? in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So, minutes are approved. With a motion by Aaron and a second by Marcella, as it was. Yep. Okay. Mike, it said that you sent the statement, the vision statement out previously, before this meeting, before the September 20th. It was way before. He sent yeah. it, it was in the summer. summer. Yeah. You want me to resend it? Yeah, if you would, that'd be great. Thanks. Did we, we, we don't, I guess we don't have copies here tonight of that. I could it, go print it out. It's, it's on the agenda as something to possibly discuss. Yeah. But we don't, yeah, you know, we don't, we don't have to if we don't have it. All right. So we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is just a summary of where we are so far. So the, the goal for the meeting tonight, the main goal, is to review for the public where we are in reconsidering the uh, city's regulations on design review and the accompanying map that goes with the design review boundaries uh, and where the design review applies. Uh, so to catch everyone up, if, if anyone's seen this for the first time, uh, the way this process started was that the uh, Historic Preservation Commission drafted, for, with working with the de Design Review Committee, as I, as I remember, works, is that right? Sorry, no, we're, like we're all hearing feedback. this noise. Yeah. There's a oh. ceiling fan over there that's So <laughs> breaking us up, sorry. Uh, so, so the so the process started with with uh, those groups uh, working on some proposed regulations together, and then they uh, brought those informally to the planning commission, uh, and so we had a meeting uh, where we were where we were where those were presented to us, and we had another meeting where the planning commission itself reviewed those regulations, uh, and we ended up producing feedback kind of informally out of that meeting. Uh, at the same time, uh, about the same time that happened. The Planning Commission uh, started looking at the design review boundary for the city uh, and kind of on its own pr has presented uh, a preliminary a boundary that, uh, for others to review. So, so that's where we are and that's what we're going to discuss tonight. We're going to discuss where the regs are and we're going to discuss where the map is. Uh, and as I said earlier, the Planning Commission will plan to vote on those two things next week. So with that, we can invite Meredith, uh, who's the staff member uh, for the Commission and Committee, to talk about the regs. And I don't know if we don't need to go into great detail. Yeah, and that's, I, at this point, I don't know if you want the full presentation or in history, or if, considering we don't have a lot of public here, right. if we should just go forward with HPC's um, most recent 
input? I, I don't know. It kind of depends on what you want. I'm prepared for any I, of it. I think just just for in case in case there's public that end up watching us okay. that, that are interested in the topic, maybe a very general five minute, ten minute overview of, of the major things in those in the regs, and then and then the we major can and then we, differences or also the history. I think just a summary of what the what these regs will be doing okay. to those who it, do they apply. Is that is that okay with everybody? And then, um, and then we can talk about yeah about specifics between the commissions. Um, so just as a refresher for people here, um, you went over and, and sort of summarized the true history that. HPC took up this task in 2017 and started drafting. Um, they use a lot of different resources, both within Vermont as well as nationwide, to come up with a new draft of the design review regulations. This really is a, in a lot of ways, a brand new draft. They incorporated things that were in the current regulations that seem to make sense that were very Montpelier specific, but really elaborated on the language. So you can't really run a red line from what's in place now to the new draft, um, and then had you know it was, a, it was a public process. There was a big kickoff meeting in spring of 2018. A variety, a large number of public meetings held by the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, there were some you know, public attendees, um, as well as input from um, you know guest presenters. And then also a community open house in the summer of 2018. Um, and as discussed previously, there was cooperation with other committees um, here in the city, especially the design review committee, since they will be who will be implementing these regulations. Um, and then also, you know, administrative input from Mike Miller and myself to make sure that the new regulations can actually be administered. Um, and these are the major goals for this new draft. So improve the predictability and consistency, make sure that when we come out with decisions, they're defensible. There's something that backs up the decisions, um, especially any specific conditions that are laid in. Um, you know, one of the big picture ideas was that the Historic Preservation Commission really wants to keep this a design review regulations and not limit it to just historic. So that comes into play later um, with the exact changes that were made. Um, you know, a lot of these changes had to be consistent with the National Parks Rehabilitation Standards um, to meet the <laughs> certified local government standards. And that's important because being a certified local government allows the city to take advantage of certain grants. Um, and, you know, as it says, more flexible for applicants um, as well as making sure that there's clearer exemptions and making it easier to provide options for administrative officer review. So some design <coughs> review things can now just go through the planning department and get zoning administrator approval instead of having to actually go to a design review committee. Whereas right now almost everything has to go through the design review committee, which is just a longer process. So these are the core changes. Added um, very specific standards. So right now, the current regulations really have like tw about a dozen kind of vague criteria, um, as well as a few specifics for a couple <coughs> of zoning districts. It really felt like that was hard to defend. Um, and so they've created really specific standards for when alterations or additions are made to historic buildings versus alterations or additions to non-historic buildings or brand new buildings. So there's those two very specific categories in the new draft. Um, the application process has been clarified. As I said earlier, there's now options for the administrative officer to review certain things and approve them without design review and having to go to the design review committee. And we've also increased the number of exemptions. I think this is all, this is more detail as to what that means and give section references for people at home. We can look at that with the draft. What, I think just one, one kind of very large takeaway, though, is that 
with these regulations, there's things that are go under design review, and there's things that go under historic preservation review. Mm, no, no, it's all, it's all, it's all design review. It all, it all goes through design review. But there's specific standards. If you're coming in for design review of a new building, there are specific standards that the design review committee will apply. If you're coming in and you're making changes to a historic building there are other things that will apply. There are also standards that apply no matter what your project is. Right. Um, so you have your global design review standards, you have a just design review subset if you're dealing with a historic building, and then you have a design review subset for if you're dealing with yeah. a non-historic building. And, and that will those also... Those subsets is what I was getting to. Yep, yep. And then and it'll also... That helps administratively so that you can come out with different worksheets and also tell people, okay, these are the sections you need to look at and make sure your project meets these. If somebody's coming in, it's going to be a lot easier for people to understand what applies to their project um, and easier for us to just pull these and say, oh, let's do a checkbox. Have you met, have you thought about all of these things? Um, yeah, I, I think most of the rest of this is stuff that it makes sense for people to take a look at or they can call our office if they have questions. Um, so, these are exemptions, uh, that's some outstanding questions that are things that, you know, you're talking about the design review boundaries, district boundaries, we already brought that up, and one thing that is unanswered in here, there's a definition for what that is in these regulations, but whether or not the Planning Commission wants to really limit that and make it specific to views of the state house or something else at this point in time is a question that you might want to deal with because it's a little vague right now. Um, it's very similar to what's in the current regulations, but I know Mike would like mm -hmm. to limit that and make that a little more specific to make it a little more defensible. Do we know what page? Uh, that so that's the five? very end. The definition of you should, should be. Uh, page 15. Oops. We're no longer in alphabetical order. Um, page 15, number 30 at the bottom, definition of view sheds and vistas. It's really more of a general definition in here. And very open. It's a very open. It is a little bit limited. When you get to, hold on. Um, so it's used on page six as a design standard that applies to all projects. And so page six, Roman numeral six, where applicable, development shall be designed to respect view corridors and significant vistas. Of course, we're not using the right terminology there. That needs to be fixed. Uh, generally, including gateway views of the city and state house specifically. So it's still, it's still pretty vague. It's narrowed a little bit with that language. But and as, as I said, we need to do some cross-checking and making sure we're using the defined terms where they apply. Why was the definition written so broadly when this is pretty specific to two locations? Um, I think that the, and somebody else can discuss here if they need to from, from HPC, but I think that the Historic Preservation Commission didn't want to limit what might be considered view sheds in the future. That if the definition of view sheds is really, really limited, then it doesn't give it, it's it's easier to limit that I think in this pr provision here than in the definition, I think. But I mean, at least that that was my takeaway as to why they defined it that way. You could narrow it in either place, I think. If it's if it's kept broad, is the concern that it's d too difficult to administer, or something else? I think it's, you know, you do run into the, does it start applying everywhere? Are you talking about just a view of the dome? Are you talking you can see some little teeny tiny corner of the state house? And what do you, you know, it, Yeah, and Mike I think looking at the maybe. definition of the uh, view corridors and vistas, it's, you know, anything that's 
anything that's forested or anything that's open space and you end up in a point where it's like, wait, if it has trees, we can't develop it, and if it doesn't have trees, we can't develop it, isn't this just saying you can't develop anything that isn't already developed? Um, and then the second piece is if it gets too vague and it gets challenged in court, then you end up with um, applicants need, need to have a reasonable expectation of what's expected in their application and, and what their requirements are going to be. And in a requir requirement that's just too open-ended um, really doesn't work well. The, the more appropriate way to address this would be to, to be very specific about what you want to consider a view shed. And if in the future we want to consider other things and we do a view shed analysis and we do a public process and we adopt rules that then go and say, you know, view sheds include views of the State House Dome and views of forested hillsides as identified on map A-1. And then you have a map that identifies what those are. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what you see in, in places like Stowe. They have a ridgeline zoning. They draw a map. And they have a map that says any of these that are on the map are there. It's gone through a public process. And therefore, it's kind of defensible because it's got a basis. It's not. It's not vague. An applicant does know they're going to have to meet these rules when they apply because they look at the map and say, "My project is in, or my project is not in." Yeah. This. So this standard was originally just for the Western Gateway, so people coming down off the interstate from that area. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> but I know that you know the Planning Commission really wanted us to to get rid of these district specific sections that are in the current zoning regulations because a lot of that was duplicative of the new set that was that was drafted by the Historic Preservation Commission. So really the yeah. only you know this standard and the following riverfront standard were the two items that really seemed unique and that we pulled into this list of all projects standards. So um, so one so one possible solution, considering that, would be in that sub six to specify that provision to the Western Gateway and possibly the river. Uh, we Still. could be before that was just Western Gateway, um, and the one below it, sub seven, was just riverfront. Um, for sub seven, I don't know if that makes sense to keep that to just riverfront anymore, but it's something to think about. Um, I mean, you could do that. It still is your still your definition of what a view shed is is pretty. I mean, it's it's narrowed that way, but it's still fairly broad. So the issue is that the definition is so broad, we're trying to narrow it in these two subsections, but maybe not effectively. I think we by taking out the vague part of that definition, I think we could fix it. Where it says include but not limited to, limit it. Limited to the things that are said, and if we specifically know what we're, if we know in our head what we're looking at, you know, it's the the land that's owned by National Life on this side of the river. Well, then just draw a map that shows that, and, and it kind of clarifies. These are the woods we're talking about um, in this view shed that this should be protected, and if there are other. Yeah, view sheds that meet that, then it's, it's, it really is. I'm, I'm a big proponent of regulating to the map. It makes it a lot easier to, very easy to defend, very easy for us to decide what needs to meet the rule and what doesn't. Yeah, I mean, that would be basically, because this, this whole chapter is really, the whole, ch this is just a section, but the chapter itself is overlay districts. It'd be pretty easy to throw in something that says, you know, view shed overlay districts are as defined in you know a, a separate map yeah. and map out a few areas it would be a lot clearer to have it mapped yeah. because I mean, it might change even as you drive along the river things yeah it seems like it's so variable but to try to define it with words yeah for, for references even yeah I mean you can put a thing around it and I mean from a map and a 
in a regulation standpoint, you could have four different areas that are view sheds and simply go and circle them and, and then put a number in there and say, this is what we're trying to protect here. This is, this is the critical piece of, you know, the, the, the character that we're trying to protect of section one, section two along the river. It's being protected for this reason, and we're looking to make sure that these characteristics are maintained in the future. And then we can then use the development proposal and kind of put that against this to go through and say, is it going to have a negative impact on that? I guess I'm a little fuzzy on when you when you go to map something, are you res you're restricting for the entire design review district what can be built based on the view of the thing, or are we trying to map only only here do we care about how you build? You know what I'm saying? Like only from the Western Gateway do we care about views of the State House. I mean, of course we care about other ones, but that's the the prime one. I feel like I don't know. It depends what you're. It yeah, depends. Yeah, we're not being clear right now about about how broadly we want this to apply. Yeah, are we trying to conserve something the way it is, or are we trying to preserve a view of this from here? Where, from what location? Yeah. Because that could make a huge difference, and and it makes me think about you know one Taylor would this impact that you know because it could have changed the gateway view into the city, mm -hmm. so um, but certainly not in a negative way. I hope. Um, so it's uh, it seems like we the only way we can do it is with a map identifies areas and talks about views from where. So how do we deal with it? Uh, I, I would probably tackle things <clears throat> one at a time and decide, start with the State House Dome. We want to protect that. And then the question comes up, is it just State House from State Street? Is it Memorial Drive? Is it Taylor Street? How far out? Is it all the way up East State Street? And when you get up East State Street, you've got to kind of, you've got another view where it comes back. Does that have, does that, you know, and then you can go through and put lines on a map and um, the Regional Planning Commission has talked about the fact that they now have with with the LIDAR they, they were going to do some buildings getting our buildings put on potentially so we could do some of these view shed analyses it's not perfect but it'll get you a pretty good idea of so is this a big enough question where we need where we could pop maybe take that project on later then and not try to handle it in the next week or the next I, couple oh, weeks? Oh, yeah. I mean, my there is a view shed analysis of the State House Dome that I have on the shelf downstairs. So we do have a study of that question. It may, may not be as comprehensive of what we're looking for, but I think it was done in 2002. But I think in the future, whether it's the State House Dome or any of these other view sheds, my thought would be that we do, we take it out of here for now, knowing that we can put it in at a later date when we have something that is defensible, rather than try to put something in that's vague, knowing that it's going to cause us problems. So, sorry, Mike. Do you mean take the whole view shed thing out completely, or just, just limit it to the state house dome on this one? Because uh, well, we have I mean, we could just analysis. Yeah, we we could right probably now. leave the state house dome in because we do have an analysis on that one, and we have been enforcing it for a number of years. So, I mean, Eric has something to say about this. You what? You're going to need to come up to a microphone. Sorry, or I can bring it to you. Maybe. <sighs> yeah, feel okay. free to take it to the seat if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Eric Gilbertson. I chair the Historic Preservation Commission and sit on design review. Uh, and I was just thinking about the State House as it, it shouldn't only focus on the dome because I believe it's probably the only State House, I think it's the only State House in the country that has a wooded hillside behind it and it sits in a, a residential neighborhood getting less and less residential, but the buildings in the, are residential. You come off Court Street and not too many, well, I guess a few years ago now there's a proposal to move the Pink Lady and put up a, like a 10-story office building uh, at, that, it, at that juncture. 
So I, th I think it's important to put something in there that you can deal with it. I mean, I'm thinking about, you drive in Elm Street, you've got that whole hillside behind the Nature Center. Uh, I don't know what anybody would be planning on doing there. I think building buildings along Elm Street probably doesn't impact the view shed. But it, every way into town, one of the most impressive views of the State House is uh, coming down Berlin Street. If you come down from the hospital, there's the, there's the Capitol sitting right there. So a, a house on Berlin Street could really block that, or a bigger apartment building could really block that. Uh, and it, it, I think the view the setting for the city, which comprises the view sheds, really important component in the general appearance of the of the city and the impression you get of it. I mean, the state house really—you see it every way you come into town. You see it. Uh, so I mean, that's probably one to call out. I know, get messed up with the. Uh, the uh, I, I think it's certain that we need to be very careful and and. Be very smart about this because it's not it's not a little thing uh, um, so for me the question is can we do it can we even do the state house justice it next may week? make sense that we actually look at this protect the views of of we'll just use the views of the dome as a catch-all for now as a separate overlay district that we would then map out where it's located i'm just thinking um, Eric points out that you can see it from Berlin Street, you can see it from East State. These are both areas not in design review. So mm -hmm. once you're outside the box of design review, the design review rules don't apply. And that's, and so that's why. So if we wanted to yeah. protect the views of the dome, we may need to just go and do its own overlay district that says, you know, we can see it from here, we can see it from here, we can see it from here, mm -hmm. and we can see it from up here. Yeah. Getting to Therefore, what we were talking about earlier, yeah. it's like design review is about what you can build within that area, which it doesn't seem like a good match for this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if they overlap, then yeah, we could, if they, they overlap pretty well, but it sounds like there are going to be a number of places outside of the design review district mm -hmm. that's going to get missed. So it may be one that we pull out, but I'll add to my list. I'll send out that 2002 report and we'll see how helpful it is. I haven't read it. I just know it's sitting on my shelf. Is there anything done in the cityscape with uh, views, view sheds at all in the original? I'm trying. I can't even remember off the top of my head. I can't. I would have to look at either. it. Yeah, I right. thought it was yeah. mostly streetscape. I think but it is mostly streetscape. You remember it, Eric? The cityscape study. Yeah. yeah. Did that have anything about view sheds in it? I don't. I don't think so. Okay. One of the things on the big backdrop of the state house, one of the uh, zoning proposals that came up, that would actually permitted construction of buildings uh, on that hillside behind the state house. It was, it was part of a uh, development area. I think that's a, um, you know, I, I know from, I know Montpelier needs land, but uh, I've got some land up behind there, and uh, I'll tell you, we held it over. Isn't that Hubbard Park? There's some land off behind Cliff, yeah, the, there's this wedge in the middle that's owned by the state. There's a piece to the west that is owned by Gilbertson. There's a piece to the right that is behind Cliff Street. Okay. There are a number of private owners of some land behind there who, my understanding is they purchased it because they didn't want to see that developed. So yeah. when it became available, the property owners came together and bought it up. But it is still technically in private ownership. In private Do ownership. Our regulations allow development there? Yeah, it, they could. There's, I mean, there's sewer lines up there. So the fact that it's really hard to develop up in there doesn't actually prohibit the development in there. I think um, it is one area that was down zoned in the one of the few areas that was down zoned yeah, in the last zone. I yeah. think you're right. Hmm. 
Well, so well, let's play mission thought on, on, on the view shed question. Do is this something we want to handle in the near term, or do we want to wait? I think that's kind of the threshold question. What do you mean by near term? Uh, at the same time as we, or do we want to partially or fully try to uh, address that in design review now, or is it something we want to tackle as a separate issue later, after looking at the studies that have been mentioned? And I mean that. I think we should look at it later, and, and it's potentially something that we'd want to see included in the city plan. So because, okay. yeah, because it could affect any kind of developable areas. I wasn't even thinking about the area along um, more, um, Memorial Drive previously. So anyway. Anyone else have anything to say about it? Given the current schedule, I think we would have to. Right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless, unless okay. there's a map already waiting for us sitting <laughs> yeah. downstairs in the 2002 State House Dome report. Um, so, th so that means the two provisions in here about view shed maybe have those removed and have the definition removed for now. But yeah, there's only one. Only one of these is a view shed provision. The um, for parcels with river and street frontage. Mm -hmm. That's that's a river frontage issue. That's about making sure that river sides of structures. Are equal in character and quality to those on the street side, so that because the river side you can see, mm -hmm. and a lot of these buildings just like you could from the street. So this is a different issue, the sub seven. Mm. But six, you said you're regulating this now. Yeah, this the is state house views. So if we take yeah. it out, that doesn't sound like a great idea. Either. What is? How does that change how you're regulating now? Well, I mean, it will completely take it from out of design view. There won't really, there won't be that criteria anymore. Is I mean, it, it's, right now it only applies to people within that area. Right now, it just applies within Western Gateway. Um, I, this is on. still just within Western Gateway. No. Hold on one second. So this would expand it to yeah. the entire right. yeah. design review yeah. district. Uh, right. I thought it was written in here, it's already the full district, right? Yeah, and now it's, yeah, well, this would expand it to the whole. Like, Which would uh, be a stopgap measure for right now. Right, so I think taking um, it out might be. So, so currently, um, the standards, and this is generally applicable, not just Western Gateway, recognition of and respect uh, for view corridors and significant vistas, including gateway views of the city and state house. That is currently what is one of the major design review criteria. Applies to everything. But that's all it says. It's very broad. Um, the design review committee typically will take a look at you know, where the property is, what, what kind of impact they think it's gonna have on those views. And you, a lot of times it's a height issue or a massing issue, you know, is it blocking a current view? I haven't, you know, they came up in the parking garage and the hotel. I think it came up in the transit center. Um, I don't think it came up anywhere else since I've been here. Mike, can you think of any other big projects where it came up? The biggest project that it came up in was the bank Mm -hmm. Credit, uh, union. Union. Credit union, thank you. Mm -hmm. Credit oh. union was the biggest one, um, which is why if you're driving on Memorial Drive, you'll see the building continue to step down as you're going around the corner because it's designed to keep the dome above hmm. the building, so the building would not block the dome. Yeah, it was. A, it or at was least a, so I have been told. <laughs> and, it was, uh, and it was a big. It was a big issue for mm -hmm. the garage. The parking garage yeah. came up a lot. Public yeah. brought it yeah. up. Yeah, will a it lot. will it block the view from the bridge? Will it block the view from Memorial? Will it block the view from yep. Berry Street? Okay. Um, so I mean, it it might be a I don't know. It could be. I mean, it could be kept and just simply narrowed. Yeah, that provision narrowed to Western Just Gateway. to go through six, mm -hmm. uh, where applicable development shall be designed not to, I mean, it could be as, as direct as not to block views of the state house and the dome specifically. I mean, it could be just really kind of, mm -hmm. we, want, we want to keep that protection in there. From, from like public vantage points? From, yeah, 
from public vantage points would probably be. But eliminating including gateway views of the city, because that one's in there too. Yeah, because we don't know what that is. Right. I think so that's the one that needs that one needs, needs more. some definition. Is that a hill full of trees, or is that an open space? And then work on the viewshed overlay district as a yeah. separate project to try and give this more teeth. Yeah, flesh flesh out. I do think it's important that we get that in, but I think in light of the state JAM golf decisions and some of these mm -hmm. other legal precedents that are out there, we're, we're going to be held to a standard. At some point, somebody's going to take us to task for not having enough guidance in our design review. So So what's higher risk, taking it out or leaving it in there generally for now until we uh, fix it? <laughs> I would probably leave it, uh, as I said, you know, not to block yeah. State House, state house of views of the State House and the dome, dome specifically, public or the State House dome, whatever it's specific. From public vantage points? From public vantage points. And that at least gives us something. It actually has expanded it in one sense. It used to be just Memorial Drive, and now it's actually going to be applicable in other places in the design review. But it won't be citywide. And if we do a design review study that shows we could protect this in Berry Street and Berlin Street, then then we would probably take it out of here and yeah, put it into the other one. Yeah. So Eric has something to say. Um, just quickly, what sort of the second phase of this project is developing a set of guidelines and actually stuff that could be handed out to the public about what's going on, and I think it probably, you know, view sheds could be could easily be part of that. Can I add something in, too? Sure. Yeah, Hi. please. Uh, Jamie Duggan. I'm uh, vice chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. And I guess my I would agree. I think at the moment uh, it would be best to perhaps maintain the status quo and leave it in for that uh, to afford that protection and to work on it. But I think it is something that does need to be uh, clearly identified and um, even beyond our local review process, for example, uh, unless these view sheds are clearly defined in the uh, city plan, they're not really defensible uh, in aesthetic arguments in Act 250. And so this is the place where if we're concerned about the f impacts of future developments on any of these view sheds, identifying those clearly and putting them in the plan as to be protected will help not just with the local process, but also I think, so I think you do need to look at it. I, I like the idea of the overlay and looking at, because it is going to be areas, vistas, and uh, even places that are outside of the design control district. So in order to capture all that, I think that, that sounds like a good plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you're proposing to modify six, Mike, and then, but then what happens to the definition? I don't know if we need it. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah I would. It's, it's problematic on its face. So how much of a pain will it be to amend this later just for this when we do an overlay district? Uh, it would be a separate section. If it was a whole separate overlay district, right? Yeah, if we're adopting, if we were adopting an amendment to add the overlay district, we would simply have strike. Okay, so we would add the overlay district. Because it's the same zoning, because it's the same we, regulation. We would, it's we, just would, one adoption. We, would, we would change this regulation and we wouldn't create a new regulation for that. Correct. Okay. It would be an, another part of the zoning. You have the base zoning districts. Then you have a design review overlay, and you'd have a view shed overlay that I, I just I, separate. I that's separate. I it's that all in the same regulation. If, if we were, if it were going to be a separate regulation, then we could try to make a sunset or something for this, but we don't need to get into that fancy stuff. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we're going to omit um, definition thirty. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Delete it. Delete it.
think we have a modified language for six. Mm. My understanding was yes, that it's the where applicable development shall be designed um, not to block views of the state house dome from public vantage points. Okay. I think we don't. I mean, I would prefer state house. Mike was going right. towards state house dome. Well, because yeah, because <laughs> there's so much that's already blocked. I mean, from Memorial Drive, you can't see the building. Yeah. Already, so. What from the 2002 study was that just the dome or the full state house? I thought it was the dome, but as I said, I haven't read it all. Can we do this carefully? I mean, I'll send it out. Can we, can we just say like whatever, whatever that you should analysis. It should apply match. to yeah. it should yeah exactly if that's the starting point that we're going to use yeah, yeah. That's I think it's the best information we have right. yeah mm -hmm. Mike can, can take a look for next meeting because there's no reason for us to vote on specific language okay. now okay. so we can because we're voting next meeting yeah okay yeah so we need yeah to vote because now. that making those maps would yeah. make the most sense to me right so question. At this point, would you like me to go into what the Historic Preservation Commission is pushing back on since your last set of edits? Uh, yeah, yes. with, with, with no one from the public here, I don't think there's anything okay. else for us to talk about. So we could we can spend the rest right. of our time doing that. So, we but we could also get into the map later. We should probably try to set this. aside time. For so that. these are the one that we've got. That we've got? Yes, because I wasn't sure if we were going to even talk about this today. Um, so these, I'm passing around right now, edits per um, October 15th, Historic Preservation Commission comments. So this is a red line. Um, so it's a red line based on our last? Yep. This other yep, it's a red line to the one that, you, that was circulated says, previously. The one that says edits per planning commission from July no. to August? No. 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 This is, one. so, right. This is based off of that one. Right. This is a red line to. Apparently a red line Sorry. and a blue line. Well, wait, the blue line are additions, it's red lines are deletions. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. Um, so, the changes on page five are just minor, it was a fix, it was fixing a typo. Um, the first major change is, I guess it's not major, but the first really substantive change is on page eight. What about oh, seven, seven is not... Last line of seven. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, so there was a, a pushback about talking about changes that have, over time, that have acquired historic significance in their own right. That was some language that was in a prior draft. Um, and so we've pulled it up into this generally applicable area. Um, you know, it, before the way it was included, it didn't really work as a standard. Um, it was more along the lines of something that might be in guidance, guidelines, was sort of an opinion statement. Um, and so adding it here is a clarifier as to what, um, what are historic materials. Is something the Historic Preservation Commission would like to to do so it's right up front that um, you know historic materials that should be preserved don't necessarily have to be something that was put on the building when the building was first built because oftentimes it's not right because oftentimes you're talking about you know something that was put on the building 30 years after it was first built but now it's 200 years after it was first built they don't want people to be stuck in a particular era um, if that makes sense. So this, so is, was, but this was about materials, right? Yeah, right. It's specific to materials. Well, this is specific to, so this is about additions and alterations to historic buildings, right? So development shall not destroy historic materials that characterize a historic building. And things, you know, materials that characterize a historic building can be things that change, they can have changed over time, the building can have changed over time, and you're not just preserving the first creation of the building. I think uh, there's, there's it, nothing in the definition of historic building that suggests. So I think um, the initial concern that, certainly the initial concern that I had 
was that the phrase um, has acquired historic significance in their own right. My concern was having that included as a part of being historic. So for, from an applicability standpoint, as we're looking at things, we get an application and we're going to look at our, our GIS data layers and other information to go through and say, is this a historic building? And we're going to look at the historic register, yes or no. What we didn't want it to have is a strange qualifier at the end that said, or things that have acquired historic significance in their own right. So things that aren't on the list but are historic. I mean, how, how are we going to administer that? How are we going to enforce that? How is an applicant supposed to know if their non-historic building has now established historic significance over time? And so I pushed to kind of pull that back. I was like, either if it's, it's, it's historic and we keep that register updated or it's not historic. And it, so you're either, we have to decide, are you going to meet point B or are you going to meet the requirements in point C? And we have to be able to have some way of knowing that and not have a vague thing that sits out there that says, or if we feel like it, we're going to stick you into the historic. Well, but, but this... It's about the material. This, materials. this is being applied. So we took it out. We had a discussion in the past on that. And so we took it out of kind of everything. And now that I think there's a push to put it back to go through and say, we're not talking about the question of whether something is in B or C. What we're saying is we know it's in B because it's historic. And we're going to qualify, you shall not destroy historic materials that characterize a historic building, including changes that have acquired historic. So we're still talking about a historic building. We're not talking about applicability. We're talking about something as a specific instance. And yeah. hopefully I haven't completely <laughs> turned well, everybody and, around. And there are, I mean, there are definitions for character-defining features and historic materials in the back, but I think the worry is that when somebody's reading this, people don't always go back to the definitions. And so having this here as a qualifier when you're talking about material, when you're looking to change materials on a historic building, to have that clarifier up front makes it, even though it may seem like with more words you're going to confuse people, I think it's actually going to make more sense to people so that they, or at least they look at that and they go, wait, I need to ask more questions versus they just assume what's going on. My reading is that there's not really much risk that someone can make an argument that historic only means when it was first built. Agreed. And like that well, doesn't, it that was doesn't put seem into like a different a, place a good before. It was in a different place yeah. before, and now it's been kind of specifically about materials. Now it's mm -hmm. being specifically applied to materials. So if materials were added to the building after, as you said, thirty years after it was built, um, those could or could, could be considered historic, but might not. Right. I mean, that's the, you know, the, the a listing on the National Register usually has a lot of detail about what is characterizing the building, and that is often what is looked to. Um, and, you know, they, it may talk about additions and changes, changes and yeah. things that were changed. And if they're in the listing now, they're often considered, okay, this is, this is now another character-defining feature. And Eric, let's, <laughs> Eric has something to add, which would be great. The I think that the, the, what this was designed to deal with was a, a building, say in 1840, really simple Greek Revival building that had been updated with a porch from 1880, a bay window, and I think those become contributing pieces of the historic building. I think that to, to, to say, yes, this is historic, uh, it's, uh, uh, if you want to take the bay window out, no, it's part of the historic character of the building. That, Do, is I, there a date on that that would define, is it more than 50 years old? I, I, I mean, I would, I would look to, as Mike said, to the National Register documentation. To see if it's listed on What's on, on what, the what's the description on the National Register? Uh, what the photograph is with the National Register? That's a good baseline to deal with it. Would it clarify if we added the two words in materials? So, development shall not destroy historic materials that characterize a building, including changes in materials over time that have acquired historic significance mm. in their own right. Does that make it a little 
clearer? Yes, there might be historic aluminum siding by this point. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Mike. You remove the word historic the first time. It's no, I would keep the historic in there. I would just go and say including changes in materials because I think the, a little bit of the confusing is because it. We talk first about historic materials that characterize historic buildings, and then we have the qualifier. The qualifier isn't to historic buildings. The qualifier is for the earlier historic materials. I think that makes sense. So just referring back to including changes in materials over time. So you're just you're adding including changes over materials. In materials, yeah. In materials. Anyone else have anything? I don't see the harm in having the clarification, as, as Mike just proposed to. I don't think it clarifies anything. I don't think legally it does, but I don't think I don't think there's any harm though. The world of I don't. I don't understand. I still don't understand what. I don't understand what the sentence says. I think a material is tough for me. Is it, it says it's a construction material, so I guess they but it's made out of construction material, right? So it would be the porch itself. Yeah. Right, like the well, porch, the like porch seems more significant than a material. Right, well, exactly. Right. A yeah, window is a material. You put a window in the wall, but a porch Siding is, is a specific material. Exactly. <laughs> a wind, well, a window could, if you're going to look at it from that standpoint, as, as an element, a porch is an element, then a window is an element, too, because it's not just doesn't just look this one way. It's not like a piece of clabber that is defined by its, you know, it could mm -hmm. it could have many appearances. Mm -hmm. well, no, I, I see what you're saying. No, I, yeah. I just, yeah, <laughs> the, I'm a little. Well, uh, part of it is also that you're looking at layers of definitions. Yeah. So they went to historic materials in this particular item. Mm -hmm. Historic materials are things that are part of character defining features. So yeah. character defining features can be the overall shape of a building. Um, you know, decorative details. So you're talking about you know particular style of molding or cornices, and what those materials are made out of. So if it's if it's currently a stone cornice, whatever you have to replace it with, you want it to at least look like another stone cornice. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Sort of. Let me know when you're ready to move on. <laughs> so, are we, so, so do we? Yeah, do we have any further? Is this is there's, this, this. There's different. This this subset. Depending on the historic <laughs> building, depends on what would be a historic material that characterizes a historic building. In certain cases, certain historic pieces are more important than others to establishing that historic character. And so development shall not destroy historic materials that characterize a historic building. So, I mean, it doesn't say you can't destroy any historic material at all. Just the ones that, okay, so it's just It's going to, we're going to, there are going to be certain pieces that are very important. If we're looking at, um, you know, uh, a Victorian building, there's going to be a lot of historic elements and materials that define that style of historic building. Others are going to probably have less, but you know, the question is if a foundation collapses under a building and it's laid up granite, is the laid up granite foundation a character defining feature of that Greek revival building it's or is it just the foundation? The building itself is the important piece and right. if we do something you know how do we fix the foundation that's where we would come into design review and historic preservation is going to come in and make cases to is that granite foundation actually a historic designing you know integral piece or can we remove that and put in a real foundation a real foundation <laughs> yeah. because it's in the floodplain and it's got erosion right. so or even if we redid this or, or do we have to take the concrete and make it look like or do we have to do the concrete material. and put a mis historic oh, facade God. on it or yeah. but yeah. that's the question that comes up is is that's what we're looking at when we get in here of, of that they have to deal with. Yeah. So if you're looking at the register, though, that might have the 
original materials, but that would also have those significant changes. Mm -hmm. So I think Aaron's point yeah. is, therefore, that comment isn't necessary. If you're looking at if you're looking at that as the metric anyway, which you would be doing regardless. And it's already that metric's already contemplated in the definition. That it's yeah, I mean, back. <laughs> it wouldn't change anything in how you're actually reviewing it. Correct. Like True. It. Correct. It, it gives the DRB the ability to make this analysis on its own already. It doesn't need to have its initial light. And that's, I mean, that's why where it was before it was struck because it made more sense to have it be an explanation and a guideline. Should um, it be added to number so 11 in the definitions instead? And then that would clean up the requirement. The requirement sure. would just be you shall not destroy historic materials that characterize a building, period. The definition of historic materials says construction materials of a historic building structure or site thereof are part of a character defining feature, including changes over time that are acquired by historic I think, significance. I think, I think the definition of historic materials as is is sufficient. There's, there's nothing in that definition that suggests that changes that are made subsequent to the original construction of the building can't be part of the de character defining, that uh, can't be a character defining feature. It, it, it gives the tribunal the ability to figure out what's the character defining feature. And that includes historic final site. <laughs> <laughs> that's, where we end up going. that's where they end up going. I don't, and I, and I don't disagree with you. I mean, yeah. that was one of the ones that I pushed to remove before, um, yeah. but I could see the value of why they <clears throat> wanted to put it back in. It was less less problematic putting it back in here as a qualifier to historic materials. I don't think it's a necessary piece, but if it's do helpful. We, do we have someone from Historic Preservation that would like to make the case for keeping it? For the... To, to have this clear, to have this clarifying language about significance of their own right, or would are you guys fine if we just end up not having that clarification? I, I'm not sure what significance in its own right means. <laughs> okay, so you're not going to bat for it. Okay, <laughs> sounds like. Um, okay. I just I just kind of don't know how that could happen unless it's uh, okay. a modern addition to a building. Okay. So who has to have this put in this location? It, it was it was a historic preservation commission change. We change. can we can take it out. Yeah, I mean this, okay. these are all. I, I don't think the historic. I mean Eric can override me if you want. I don't think the historic preservation commission is going to. It's not like the historic preservation commission is going to outvote the planning commission and say this has to be okay. in. Okay. Okay. So in that case, we'll we'll plan to not not have that in what we consider next week because okay. uh, I'm not getting just from, from the planning commission I'm not getting the vibe that people want that either. So are we talking about taking out everything in blue? Everything yes. in bold, yes. In blue. The blue, blue. underline. Blue underline yep. number five. Yep. Okay. Or just, just okay. not just making that change is the way I was yeah. saying right. that. Right, reject the uh, change. And then so we can move on. So we do have a few more and we <laughs> want to in about 25 minutes be done with this so we can actually talk about the map for a few minutes because in, in case we have feedback about that from okay the so others. page eight number six there was a question on um whether or not new development um on historic buildings uh needed to be compatible and respect both um, the character of the primary building, just the character of the primary building, or character of the primary building and nearby properties. HPC decided to throw in and nearby properties, but it's it's a it's a little bit of a big picture compatibility question. I mean, when you look in the design review district right now, if you're looking at a new building going up, you care about whether or not it's compatible with surrounding building so if you're talking about an addition onto a historic building it should probably be compatible with both the historic building that's being added to as well as nearby properties that was the way historic preservation commission came down yes um so that was okay so this this could possibly preclude development if you already have a large building that's dwarfing its neighbors and you're trying to add something that would maybe be compatible with that building but maybe not the others 
it would it be more be, might be a bridge. I mean, in terms of the, you know, if you already have a building that's that's out of character, that whatever you add on to it should at least be sensitive to the nearby property. Yeah. So that you don't add an addition that's also equally as un yeah, uncharacteristic. So I think the problem with this one, sorry to be wet blanket. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it, you've got two situations here. One is is that you have a property that you're not looking to add new development on um, that is compatible with the surrounding properties. So the suggestion is that if it's compatible with the one that you are that you are building on, you should be fine. But that opens the, the door to have other properties that are otherwise consistent with the one that's being built, sort of saying no, no, no. The other one would be is, and that's, I think that's a pretty low risk. The one that I'm worried about here, and I think is possible, or possible, is is you have two properties that are not particularly mm -hmm. compatible with one another, that just happen to be next to each other. And mm -hmm. that's just the way that it is. And the new development on the property is consistent with the one that it is being built on, but by definition it is going to be, um, mm -hmm. it, it would not, uh, respect or be compatible with nearby properties just by random chance and it just seems like yeah, it seems like the point of this was that we, they want um, we want to differentiate between old and new right like if it's an addition we want to show that it's a new building and like we've we probably have this like 14 times in our ordinance for things to be compatible with massing size scale we like we like just hack it on to everything after we say something <laughs> so uh, i'm not sure it's, it's, this isn't it's necessary actually, i but. don't think this is actually addressing that point um but I, I mean in reference to what you're saying Aaron, could we say in respect nearby properties i just don't think we need it right um, it, isn't well, this almost like this in, whole like then section we're about opening doing ourselves this, up for or um, I think the potential to develop additions that are not in character with the neighborhood. Yeah, right. I, 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 well, I think is what John was saying though is, is we, we have a million and another whole bunch of other places. We've that's got the, the whole massing, point of scaling. this like, section. There's a whole other. Overlay. There's a whole set of over over metrics that which the DRB is going to use to evaluate the appropriateness of any proposed development. Um, And I think that I think that those are appropriate. I think those still they still operate effectively. Seems like there's actually some risk that maybe nearby properties have become more modernized over time, and this new addition's not compatible, or can be argued or perceived as not compatible, because of changes to the other properties that you know, yeah, that's, stuff I, like I'm that, yeah, I think like, like an unforeseen consequence. Yeah. Like right in the page before, additions to existing buildings shall respect be compatible with the size, scale, materials, detailing, overall character of the primary building and its environs. I'm sorry, which part are you looking at right now? Um, page. Page five. Okay. So, yeah, that's the very, I, I mean, I guess then, I mean, then the, the important thing to, to keep here is that <coughs> any new development shall be differentiated from the old. Like this is that's the new thing that's here on sub six on page eight. Okay. Is to make and yes, there is an overarching standard, um, design standard <coughs> on page five at the very bottom. So A Roman numeral I one. It's about additions to existing buildings that does apply globally to everything. Um Character of the primary building and its environs. I mean, ultimately, you could. I guess you could. That the only the only quasi new item here is that about for historic buildings, your new development has to be differentiated from the old, and you're applying. But the that global compatibility. So I, I think just, it's the argument right. is against the nearby properties, isn't it? On this, right, but on page well, five, it's saying it has to be compatible. And uh, this page five is saying differentiated and, and compatible. 
Well, wait, no, it has to. It has to be. Wait, it has to be different. You can't have. You can't have something that copies the historic era of the original building because then it looks like you're trying to have the new addition immediately be counted as also historic, even though I'm building it today. Right. Okay. So you have to. If you're talking about a historic building, your new addition has to differentiate from it somehow. But it does still need to be compatible. This goes back to the whole Kellogg Hubbard Library Edition. You can tell that the Kellogg Hubbard Library Edition on the back is something new, but it still echoes the front. Right? So they're compatible, they're it's respectful, but it's clearly different from the front, from the original. Um with the the only just because I've had a limited time here, with the parking garage design. It was a brand new building but they needed to make sure it was respectful of the architecture that was in place in that area right now. So those are, it's a couple of different things. Like it's hard to have the color covered library, you, to use the color covered library as that example because it doesn't look like anything else around it. You mean the library itself? Yeah. Yeah, so if you're trying to compare it to um, yeah. its neighbors. Right. That's, that didn't really work for the addition. Hard. Right. So that would be like a concern about this change would be that the funeral home is like, well, that right. new, that additional library doesn't look anything like our funeral home, or it doesn't, or or we don't well, think it goes with our funeral home. Right, but but <laughs> but I mean, so so I went to so there's, <laughs> right, but then there's also so just as sort of an example that's not here. Oh, Eric, do you remember the example they used in White River Junction? Um, do you remember what the two different eras were of the building where they had a new build there was a building in the middle that they were going to renovate to the left was some like art deco building and to the right was do you remember what the other type of building was so art deco was to the left to the right was some other like classic Federal style history. yeah something like that and the building in the middle had originally just been some blah like 1950s one story <laughs> building and they renovated it and they brought in architectural elements from both the building on the right and the building on the left and made a really cool funky building that looked like nothing else in the area but it still was quote unquote compatible with because it sort of echoed them both it's this is not something that i think is going to come into play very often when it does come into play i think it's going to be important for some big new design like the parking garage or something like that you know usually it's not going to be a modification to a historic building because there's not going to be that many of those where they do some big addition so but the, so this, I, this is the clause that would pertain to them having to develop the facade of the parking garage more compatibly in scale uh no, this wouldn't be the parking garage this would be an addition onto a historic building it would only be all right. This well, particular and that was a one, question that I was going to have. We're going to need to we're going to move on yeah. real quick. I'll take like a straw poll thing, but we'll let I Eric just, say a quick word. I, just a quick comment: the you know the Secretary of Interior standards, which this is all kind of based on, said you shouldn't create a false sense of history. You're not putting in a bill. And the other thing, you know, this discussion about what's compatible and what's not compatible, that's exactly why you have the design review. Commission, yeah, and, and uh, different people are going to make a different call on it. You're hoping there's some boundaries on it, but that's why you have to rely on people to make a judgment and a call, because uh, to try to define it all in regulations, uh, right? We're just, we're, we are trying to minimize ambiguity. I mean, that's part of that's yeah, why we have yeah, these well, I think discussions. That's, that's, but. That's Sorry. good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Getting hung up on <laughs> the, the one. The one sense I was just wondering. Um, there, there, it doesn't. Even though we kind of know what it's trying to say, it doesn't actually say historic. On six. On six. So it's to differentiate. Um, new development shall be differentiated from old. It doesn't say historic. It just says old. So if we're adding a, a porch on the side of my 1982 raised ranch. That's adding something new to something old. 
do we really need to respect and compatible the massing scale and architectural features and detailings of? So any, I mean, this is we all in the. Probably do because it's in like <laughs> yeah. four other sections. It's, it's, well, it's but it's all in additions and alterations to historic buildings. I think they were trying not to reuse the same words all over again. But you could yeah. just say any new um, development on a historic, you know. Any any new you could rearrange. Well, I was just wondering, and the, and the character of the primary building could be the character of the historic building, if it was meant just to apply to historic buildings. And then the other question was, and nearby properties. Is that again? Are we referring just to nearby historic properties, or if my neighbor has a raised ranch, am I required to be taking my historic Greek revival building and now making sure that my addition on the side of my Greek Revival building is actually compatible with my neighbor's rage ranch. So Not compatible, but I mean, imagine differentiating you, it from it. Your, your, <laughs> your raised ranch, and then you've got a three-story Greek Revival building, and you want to add an addition onto it. So you want to make a three-story addition onto your Greek Revival building. Then is that compatible with, with the neighbor? Right. So, make, so make, uh, I want to do a quick straw poll. Like, if there's any interest in, if there's any interest in any any type of concept revol of evolving nearby properties, if you're interested in, in in doing it in any fashion, raise your hand. Okay, that's what I thought. Outside I'm asking, I'm asking, without getting into the weeds of it, just just for this question, this nearby properties language. If you're if you're you interested in trying to do anything in any form related to nearby properties. Raise your hand. Are you saying that because if, otherwise because if people to aren't eliminate this, this, section, this provision? Are you saying to eliminate in nearby properties? Y to, well, to not accept that addition, yes. Okay. All right. Um, that's, that's what I you were saying. Are you interested in doing this in any form? This nearby properties idea in any form, or are you okay just not doing it and moving on? So. What? We right, the yes, first yes. part of the we question: just, Are you interested in doing this at non, all? Non-binding, non-binding resolution. Yeah. Do we tentatively support the, the That's change? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that is what I'm saying. I think people understand what I'm saying. Okay. Raise your hand if you're interested. I think Barb is the only one interested, if right? If you're interested in leaving it as the change is written. proposed. Or any version of it, yes. Okay. So we're going to move on and not do that. Okay. So we're going to take that out. But Barb, next week you're welcome to like propose something as we vote. Okay. All right. But just for time of moving on. Yeah. Okay. So so we're going to move on to the next one, on sub four on this page. Yep. So this is this is language four, four. that. Wait. Oh yes. PG. This is language that had been somewhere else and planning commission. I honestly can't even remember where it was before. It was on the next um, page under. Yes, so it was it was stuck under um, projects that do not involve historic buildings. Yeah, um, and it just really didn't make sense there. Because it was, and so we've moved it under materials related to historic building changes. Mm -hmm. um, it's fine. Anyway, so that that got moved there. I, I, you guys can but just to be clear. It's, it's okay. It only applies to additions and alterations. To historic oh, buildings. Okay. I see what you're saying. All right, Does, and people. I probably wasn't here when we discussed this the first time around. That sentence makes sense because it doesn't really make sense. I didn't understand it before, when it yeah. was there before, I but don't I don't think. understand it now, <laughs> so I'll keep sense. my mouth shut. <laughs> Mike, you maybe we should circulate old technology? Unless um, it's like something. No, it just says they have materials. materials. Old materials. Yeah. It I mean, feels like it's trying to say something and <laughs> not just <laughs> saying <laughs> it. <laughs> right? it like, okay, that'd be great. The, the brick cladding, uh, or the brick. Build a building that is um, structurally brick, that is being using brick as a support material. Oftentimes, people like to come in and they don't want to affect the outside, right? So they're going to add an interior partition, an interior, and and add insulation to it. Okay, without understanding that if they do that, they may destroy the brick facade, because the characteristic of the brick facade is that it's expecting to allow moisture to go in and out of it not to get that moisture trapped. If moisture gets trapped, the brick disintegrates. So, I mean, that that one has come up multiple times in various renovations to historic buildings. Mm -hmm. And it's something that would, I, I know it's not necessarily very clear here as to what it's all about. That's something that would be clarified and elaborated in guidelines that we just can't, you know, it, the, the HPC isn't going to try and write those until we've come to agreement on what the regulations are actually going to say. 
My only concern with this is um, it, it, it doesn't get into the to degrees. It doesn't get into maybe the new thing's still more energy efficient. Yeah. Okay, so then maybe it's, 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 it could still happen, but you just want to make sure you understand. It says shall be. Right, what? there's no regulations about it. You just have to identify whatever a the an existing part. energy efficient characteristics of the building is. So maybe it shall be identified, comma, and also preserved to the extent possible. Or to the extent practical, or put something in there. I, I don't. Okay. You guys can play with that language. I think that making sure that there is a way to identify those, that those have to be considered and presented to the design review committee, so that they can review them, right. is important. And leaving it up to the design review committee as to what extent it makes sense to preserve them, I think is up up to you know common sense. As I said. This HPC is putting forward its wish list every time. Mm -hmm. This is its wish list. So if I we already tried this. Where yeah. it has the existing energy efficient characteristics, if I took out energy efficient from that and just said before implementing any energy conservation measures to be to enhance the sustainability of historic building, the existing characteristics of the building mm. shall be identified and preserved. That makes it significantly clearer in my head I, because uh, we're not. Are we just talking about? Is there like a handful of things that we could just list? Because I have no or idea that, what no. this means. It's going to change though. You know, every building will be different. It's it's well, and it's going to change depending on what through studies we feel. Mike, does it make sense to circulate that that article? Before the, um, I, I mean, I think we're getting hung up on that's this. Just, but yeah. that really, that that article is really looking at, at why you shouldn't demolish right. that's what I, and rebuild. If you take rebuild. that part out, okay. we're just oh, preserving the characteristics through like efficiency improvement. And that changes well, the meaning, though. That changes that's, the meaning that's completely. That's not the meaning that she's well, going to change. Well, then I'm not getting the So, well, I mean, it is, it is, there's it is, also... It is, it is all encompassing. We're, we're like trying to stop people from doing like stupid things, right? And there's probably like a list of stupid things that people do. It's a long one. Every building could have a different one. That, that would be something to, I think to lay out in the guidelines. Putting it in here where then to modify it when you learn something new, you have to then go through and, mo and go through the whole process of amending the regulations doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, we could put some examples as long as we're clear that they're examples. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes the examples help to to yeah. to. to well, I, don't, I don't know what existing yeah. energy efficient characteristics. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, yeah, that I mean, was the example I gave you. The existing energy efficient characteristic is the fact that the building rests on these on these brick walls, right. and these brick walls have to be maintained in in terms of how they operate, and those are the efficient energy efficient because they are the outside wall of the building. Um, right, but okay, but that's still just a characteristic of the building. No, because Who actually, if you look at the characteristic impacted. definition, the, the characteristic of the, the characteristic could be the type of brick because we, we don't have just characteristics defined. It's the right. char, you know the historic character defining my, features, which is a little yeah different. visual aspects and physical features. But is it what we're trying to protect here? You is the character of the brick facade. Not, no, no, not necessarily. It's We're trying to prevent it from degrading based on improvements. So we're trying to protect the brick right, I mean, mm -hmm. the, so well, we have lots of examples. Like I'm thinking right now, like if I want to implement an energy conservation, conservation measure to enhance the sustainability of the historic building, I want to put in heat pumps. Mm -hmm. Put it on the back side of the house. Does that mean I have to identify and preserve the radiators? Those are inside. We don't care about those. It's an energy efficient characteristic. Yeah, but it's right. inside. See, that, yeah, we're on the same wave. I don't, okay. I, I don't do, know. Do I have so, to first prove that the water baseboard heat is not, in fact, more energy efficient before I'm allowed well, to do an energy Well, okay. you're going to leave it in place anyway, so that's kind of a moot point. Yeah, I think well, you know, my concern okay, a little bit with this one is 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 the fact that it's I mean up front. So usually we're talking about development. We have a, a specific development. So before implementing quote any conservation measures to enhance the sustainability of a historic building end quote. So that's what we're talking about. If I went through and came in and applied to Meredith and said I'm going to be replacing the front door because I want to add more security measures. I don't have to meet this requirement. I don't have to evaluate it because I'm not doing it for energy conservation reasons. I'm doing it for security reasons. So the way 
you're leading into this before implementing this specific set of stuff. So all I have to do is not say that's why I'm doing it, and then I don't have to meet if 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 I don't meet the if I don't have to meet the then. Right, but that's but do, a door is going to fall into something else. It's going to fall into anyway. something else. I'm just using that but as an example. Most of these most things are going to fall in somewhere else. So. But if I replace I a window, know. do I call it an energy conservation measure, or am I just replacing a window? Well, if you replace all the windows in the building with new windows. But if I do it for a reason that's, that's, that's not energy not, conservation? It usually hmm? is energy conservation. It is or isn't? It isn't. You won't get the cost in savings and energy savings for the cost of the, you won't gain back in savings the energy. <laughs> so I'm, I'm doing it for its aesthetics and its noise uh, and, and its functionality. I'm not replacing it for energy efficiency. So I don't have, because I don't trigger the if part of this statement, I don't have to meet the then requirement of so this statement. So you're saying we should take out the if? Yeah. And this, this also goes to the question of, and this has been wow. the concern of a couple of ours here, is, is this just, is number four just the hidden club to beat people to go and say you can't replace your windows and if it is let's just go and say you can't replace your windows no um i mean i went the first time i read this i said oh yeah that's exactly what happened when people added aluminum siding to the outside of clabbered building and insulated an aluminum sided their building and then they couldn't understand why their building was falling apart uh. yeah. you, i mean is that accurate I get your example, but I don't understand how the walls themselves are an energy efficient characteristic of the building. Because the existing so wall operates a we certain have way. Yeah. Then you uh, add on sorry, insulation and siding to the outside, Where which keeps the moisture from going through. So instead the moisture that? rots your wall. No, I get that part. This is this is actually I think no, similar I to what happened. I don't think the the how it works is the, it's just the confusion just point. It's the, yeah, I get I get what you're saying. But isn't the character? I, I don't understand why the characteristic we're trying to preserve isn't just the brick wall. Yeah, I don't think anyone's isn't calling their brick wall an energy sorry. conservation. Now, no, uh, I'm sorry, I was just talking about a different example. Yeah. But what? That's what, yeah. No, so I get, I get the brick wall, foot of insulation, degradation right? so of the wall. Yeah, yeah. I get that. Kind of that. But, but um, how is the energy, how is, how is the brick actually... Is the brick wall an yeah. energy efficient characteristic? Or it's right just here. a characteristic we're trying to preserve? Energy efficient We are attempting to preserve the brick wall. We have to change wall. our characteristic definition um, then. Um, um, there is no No, the existing, I mean, you could probably still say, you could probably still say the existing character defining features of the building as well as maybe structural integrity. You know, because it, I mean, you're, what you're getting to is structural integrity, That's, really, those not are the just that end up happening which, and destroy the building. That changes the entire sentence. Meaning they just of the say sentence. don't destroy the structural integrity of the building. <laughs> Yeah, well, but that, people but don't a always. Different sentence than this. Pe well, you know, no, I, I, she's I talking about yeah. the I'm trying to definition. I'm trying. Oh, well, I'm also well, not necessarily. I'm not changing the definition. I thought you wanted to add that to character. No. No. I think we're, uh, no. <laughs> no. I was changing the second clause of this sub four, but yeah. I, maybe this is something that just. Maybe it's something that we need to can, well, can, outside of here to try and. What what was the scenario that was that's sort of being contemplated with this language? You're also, I mean, is, it, is there something specific? I mean, it's really, a, I think, a lot of it goes to what Barb was saying. But Putting is do you have another? Just because I, I wasn't here from the very beginning sure. when some of this language got started with. So it's the concern. So it's your, your concern. Do you see like what I'm talking putting about? Putting I'm following along. Okay. Yeah, sorry. And actually, there was so somebody who testified was there um, some earlier other situation about other why language? can't I do that? Mm -hmm. And in fact, he had already done it. Right. Um, yeah. so and, but he had no idea how that was going to destroy his building. Is the concern that you want to have the DRB have the ability? Well. No, we want to, to get to, to get out in front of somebody saying, "I'm going to do this because it, has, it provides energy efficiency savings for me, and that's why I'm going to be able to put. I want to be able to put an up signing up over." Like if I, I'm looking at an application, I'm putting in like a heat pump, and it says, yes. "Identify all the energy efficient characteristics of the building." So I'm going to go through and be like, "I spray foam my basement. I've got." You know, I, I insulated my walls. We, these are all like the things that I've done. I've got a solar pad. 
a water panel. Hate to tell so, you. I, so I just like go through a list of oh. things Heat that... Heat pump is not, is not necessarily an energy efficiency. You know, it is a different type of heating system which is more efficient. But that's not an energy efficient characteristic. This is the, the first clause is very broad. Before implementing any energy conservation, conservation measures. measures. Yeah, and so that, I'm seeing well, that as an energy that, conservation measure. That goes, measure. Anything you do to your walls, I would think, would be related to that. Anything you do to your walls is an energy conservation Plus measure. the heat pump, plus a bunch no, of other but, things. No, but, sorry, but the heat right. pump so is, is not. Because you could do that without, you know, modifying energy. anything else in your building. And yeah, so but it's, it's an energy still conservation not, measure. No, right? it's not. It's a it's a different way of using energy. It's it's more efficient. You could call that an energy efficiency measure. But wouldn't I be conserving energy if I was being more? Well, efficient? This is the, right. We're yeah, we're, 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 we're to, so. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's my, my, my real core question though is, is is the purpose of this to give the DRB information? Like, what are we? What information are we giving to the DRB when considering these projects? Why is that important? Yes. This is information to give to the applicant because they, this is the this is what the applicant needs to do in order to submit the application. So do we have a version of this that's less problematic? Well, <laughs> no, but I mean, I do think that I think it was speaking to some of the issues that had been brought up that um, in the past uh, there have been times when people have been promoting a particular treatment as an energy conservation measure, as it's written here, and there is science out there that shows that perhaps that's not uh, an energy conservation measure, though you know, there's, there are other benefits to it. That could be windows, it could be insulation, it could be other... Um, it, but I think what the goal was, was for there to be an understanding when these types of things are going to happen to look at the building holistically. And so there are, there are and, and to just, you know, I, you need to understand what's there in order to figure out whether you should keep it or not. So um, it's sort of taking an inventory. Okay, you know, it, is the building oriented towards the sun, <laughs> right? Is, is, are there, does it take, um, are there, are there, uh, you know, is there a cross ventilation through the design that allows natural ventilation so that it maybe doesn't need to be so conditioned? And it's looking and understanding those things to then figure out what's the best way to approach the situation of wanting to um, conserve energy. So, for example, if someone were to come in and say, well, I want to replace my windows because I want to get, you know, a better energy rating, well, there's science out there that says that you can retain the historic window and with the proper air sealing and weather stripping and a high quality storm, get, this, get similar energy performance while still preserving historic material. That's understanding it. There may be situations, though, where you know, because the windows are so deteriorated that looking at them, the cost of rehabilitating them is so great that it doesn't make sense and that actually allowing, it, that would allow the DRC to, you know, replace it. So it's looking at all of those factors, um, but coming in and saying, well, I want to replace the windows simply to have a better energy rating, that's not, um, that's, that's, that doesn't really add up. Is the DRC looking for something that's like squishy, like guidance, or are you looking for something as powerful as what this language says, which is, you know, shall be identified and preserved, which is a pretty, you know, that's that's pretty stringent. Like, it's like I, would, yes, would, I would agree that's sort of stringent. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, just to give us an idea, if we want to try to turn this into something that we think is more workable. Sure. I, I mean, the first thing, one of the things we said is even just losing the word preserved at the end because you may do this evaluation and realize, wait, this isn't the best route. We can let this element be replaced. Or, you know, it may say, no, this is important, and there, and, but to mandate it to be preserved might, I mean, that would give you more flexibility. To, but I think, it, as Bob said, there's value to understanding what is trying to be done. None of this happens in a vacuum, and, and I think placing it in context, you have to understand certain changes. By tightening up the building, 
you need to provide better ventilation or else the building will create, have mold issues and air quality issues simply by trying to make, take advantage of energy conservation measures. Would, would everyone be um, okay with, uh, if this just said, the existing energy efficient characteristics of the building shall be taken into consideration? Or, or is that is that so squishy that you think that it's worthless or what? Well, I think it's think? not specific to before implementing energy conservation measures. In addition, well, it's, I mean, this, this is in the materials section, and it goes to um, materials and. Well, taking out the energy conservation measures means that phrase would apply to to all all development, whether it's an energy conservation development or not. So. I mean, and that was my comment, was that I, I think but limiting it just to environment and energy conservation measures means as long as I characterize my development project as not being an energy project, then I don't have to meet the second yeah, half. I don't but wording it the way you did yeah, it makes it to apply to everything, whether it's an energy conservation or not an energy conservation project, mm -hmm. we should take the I buildings. Could, I could be wrong, but I feel like the windows is a, a, a big one, and we maybe we should be just clearer about it if that's something we want to, you know, address. And then, because otherwise this feels squishy and all-encompassing when, I could be wrong, but it seems like a large percentage of the time. We're talking are, about windows. Right, people are replacing windows that they may not need to and they may not know, like, that they can rebuild them and they'll be just as efficient. And that's what we're trying to, like, educate people and, and preserve those windows, but here we're clouding it or, I, I still don't understand. So, so, so the, oh. the thing I was proposing would be just a hook for the DRC to use so that they can include in their guidance, not a mandate, but it just, just guidance in about windows and, and, and further information. I don't even think it's windows are a major piece of this. But it, it, but it wouldn't result in any kind of mandate, so. What it sounds like is, is we want to give the DRP an inventory of characteristics of a building. No, we want the owner, the, the applicant, to understand how his, the building is working before they, you know, come in and just say, I want to add this right. insulation for energy conservation right. so that reasons. Be, that would be an inventory of characteristics. They want to understand the characteristics of their building. Only the only well in this case only because if you're going to add energy conservation measures, you better understand how the building works from an energy standpoint now. Uh, 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 just qu quickly, a couple of things that the, the whole window thing in energy conservation gets into a lot of highly technical things. Barbara's pointed out how you can you, you think you're doing something good for the building, you're tightening it all up, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the paint comes off. And that's because you've trapped the moisture in the building, and you're rotting the building, and you're losing energy uh, that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that this is probably a good a good thing to maybe write these regs in such a way that we're, we are going to do some guidelines, and this is where the guidelines discussion could come in about windows. I know. I'm uh, talking to Efficiency Vermont. Uh, they had an application. I've done all the obvious things, like replace the windows, and they said, no, that's the last thing you should do uh, in terms of energy efficiency, both, both on a return on investment and actually mm -hmm. uh, uh, doing it. But I think that some of this really technical stuff, uh, we had discussed about have, having requirement that a historic preservation person be put on the design that one person, at least one person for historic preservation is on design review to deal with this, some of these technical issues. Uh, so, but uh, trying to resolve all the technical issues and, and regulations is, is okay. it's not going to work. I, I think we, so I think we have a sense of, of the goal here for this, but we're not super close to getting the exact language right. So can we kick this to next week and, and discuss, um, we'll just, we'll just discuss the, exactly how we want to. Part of the difficulty is that every building is different. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you it's, it's, it's not, if you're doing new construction, you can make a rule saying there's going to be so much insulation. Yeah. And the, the problem is definitely more than windows, right? So we'll, it's, we'll discuss it's it. It's really not we'll discuss it. Right. We'll this discuss it. This is really not that about windows. 
Okay. Um, so sorry, this has taken so long. There's yeah. really just one other Great. change. Great. Definition of historic buildings, page 14. Um, previously, Planning Commission and and Mike had had taken out some language that had let a historic building also be something that was determined by the Historic Preservation Commission. So you guys had, had argued to push historic building back to just um, buildings listed on the State Register or National Register of Historic Places. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission would kind of like to, to push back on that um, to allow an opportunity um, for the historic preservation, say the applicant or somebody else has a question, it's not technically on the register, but somebody's arguing that a building is historic, to have the HPC testify before the Development and Review Board, and the Development and Review Board is the one who makes the call. This but it's, I'm just. Mike this brought is what, up JM Golf earlier, and I think this might yeah. be like a good textbook if you're trying to teach JM Golf. Yeah, and like, that's. It's where like. So does this apply to me? Well, we'll decide when we feel like deciding yep. if this applies to you. I mean, that's what it feels like. What do you think, Mike? Uh, yeah, I mean, this was when we when we talked a little bit earlier. That was what my concern mm -hmm. was, is when it's everything that's on the list and anything else that we think is on the list. Anything that's on the list has been evaluated historically. We have a anything good survey. Within the district, this is only for design review, mm -hmm. um, has been evaluated. So would we even have that kind of a situation? Does the DRB have the authority? It's just an, oh, to. Uh, Does DRB I have? Have the authority to make those determinations? Determine well, this is authorities based on the testimony from the Historic Preservation Commission. So, I mean, in theory, HPC would have a responsibility for demonstrating it. But I think the issue is that it's kind of post fact from mm -hmm. the applicant standpoint. The applicant comes in in good faith and puts in an application assuming the rules because they've looked at the National Register and noticed they're not in the National Register and therefore they can do this and then after the fact it's been altered that they now have to meet these rules I think they would if they went if they went to the environmental court I think the judge would probably go through and say that I wonder if there's, there's an, an expectation why they wanted to do this Right, so you're thinking this is this wouldn't even be much of an issue. I can't if our see where it would happen. Oh. Sorry. Oh, so just so, so the now public here has more ignore historic significance because I, I'm Bob McCullough. The surveys grew out of date very quickly and questions may arise whether a building that was formerly not included as contributing because of its age may have in the may have become historic. Um, there may be other situations too where debate occurs about where debate occurs when change has uh, a comp uh, has occurred with a building um, through reasons that <clears throat> are a little bit hard to sort of visualize but um, if a building has been damaged if it has been uh, now da damage is the one example that comes to mind there could be situations where it's necessary, where there's debate about whether or not a building continues to be historic. And I think that having the Historic Preservation Commission uh, giving them the ability to testify that yes or no, a building has either retained or lost its historic significance. Um, um, <clears throat> here's an example. <clears throat> there's a, uh, a little garden shed uh, behind the building at 159 State Street. It was probably built in the 1920s, 1930s, and it has collapsed. Does the building have historic integrity? Probably not. If not, then its historic significance has been lost. But how do we establish that? In, in what process do we establish that? And I think that having, giving the commission authority to testify is, is a good thing to do. This only allows the commission to add, not remove anything. Not to add. It's, it's simply offering testimony to the Development Review Board when the Development Review Board makes decisions about whether or not to um, deny a permit or, or approve a permit. 
these we're not, the, the, the Preservation Commission is not adding anything to the survey. It's simply testifying in a hearing as to the historic significance of a resource. Right, but it's in the definition mm -hmm. of, is a building historic? If, is it on the state register? Yes. Is it on the national register? Yes. Or if um, a non-surveyed property is determined to be eligible by the DRB based on testimony for uh, Historic Preservation Commission. So you, you get to like this point and you go down this path if it's considered historic or you go down this path if it's not considered historic. So there's no opportunity to to unlist a property or to have it considered. I think the, the DRC can say, can certainly uh, offer I think the DRB will probably follow any advice regarding the, the regulations and how that's um, <coughs> dealt with. But in terms of the definition of what's historic, they can only, uh, the way it's being proposed, add to what's being considered historic. I, I think that the garden shed that Bob was talking about is, is listed on the National Register. Sure, it's listed as contributing. It's listed as a contributing building. but. Now that the roof is caved in, the determination has been made. The owner may, now it becomes a public nuisance, perhaps, and the owner wants to take it down. So there has to be, if you went through the formal process with the National Register of delisting it, uh, maybe five years, you <laughs> Right, right. But this doesn't, this doesn't, this doesn't help you, though. That's all I'm saying. The, the, better, the better example is going to be um, up on the college, and it's now moot because it's past its its stuff that but so the one of the buildings up on the college was 48 years old not on the national register not on the state surveys but it was built and constructed in such a way that it looks historic and the question came up through an act 250 is this building up on the green historic or not historic and they made all their plans as not historic and proposed a, dump, a number of things because they assumed they were not historic because they're not on any of the registers. Act 250 lets you make these adjustments and so there was a proposal from the state that even though this is not a historic building, it's not 50 years old, it's not on the register, they proposed based on testimony that it should be treated as a historic building and in that case, I believe they won, but that's the case that we're looking at. It's, it's for us in our case of administration and doing things, we, we need to, as people come in the door, they're going to ask us, what are the requirements I need to meet with respect to design review? And Meredith is going to have to say, you have to meet requirements in subset B, or you're going to need to meet the requirements in subset C. And I think um, while the state has been given a little more flexibility, I think with these things. I think JAM Golf, that decision kind of boxes us in a little bit more at the local level to be a little bit more specific about that. I mean, I think we would, there, there are some risks in here from a legal standpoint. I, I think that the, that the design review commission is part of the city. So it would be the city saying, ha ha, we're actually going to change the rules on you part of the way through. Mm. And, and yeah, so I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, are the surveys done? How frequently are the surveys done? I was under the impression that it was at least... It varies. There, it depends on funding that's available, uh, whether we're con a preservation consultant is hired to do a survey. It, it varies considerably. Like 5 to 15 years, or...? We just updated the survey uh, two years ago? Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, the 1988. That it, had been done, it had been amended in the 80s, but it hadn't been updated since it was written in the 70s. And what do you say, the we, other, is the other it the city or the state? The there's, the some, there's some city. buildings for, that are listed on the state register in Montoya that aren't part of the National Register District, but that's for stuff from the 70s, you know, so that it's... it's, it's we include both here, though. Yeah. 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 Just one of the things, too, is that the th it could work both ways in that for example, with the, the structure that's collapsed that was listed, um, one way this could be expediting or streamlining things in some way would be, so for, it has to go for the, uh, to clear the parcel, it would need a demolition permit. 
uh, but it's listed currently as a contributing resource on the National Register. I believe, I think part of our intent was that this could be a mechanism where that person could come in and say, well, it's, it's, it no longer has integrity because it's a pile of sticks on the ground, and the HPC could provide testimony supporting that to the DRB, which could then say that it is no longer considered historic. And then they could get a demolition ordinance without having to go, a, a permit without having to go through the full historic preservation process. That's one potential way where it could be helpful. But um, it also is just calling for eligibility. It is not changing the listing at all, um, which is just the threshold that's needed even in um, state or federal review. It's just, it needs to have those characteristics. And the other factor, too, in, res in your response to your comment that, that this isn't helping us, the Historic Preservation Commission doesn't have authority to designate a building as historic. We, we don't have a role in any kind of regulatory context. And I think that by establishing the ability to testify, at least, then that at least gives the Preservation Commission uh, the opportunity to offer their expertise to the Development Review Board. That's the purpose of this. I, I feel like if we wanted to do that, it, another, the better avenue would be for us to just dictate our, without using the, these these registers, like create our own list to regulate them. That's a huge The proper way to go about something is sometimes the hard way. The, the, the other option would be to, to have gone through and say any building listed on the state register, national register, and any other structure more than 50 years of age. Th then you've got a black and white line that goes through and says anything that's 50 years old becomes historic, and, and it's a moving target. It's a shed. If it could be, that's where a question, it's a shed, and how do, how do we know when we get an application in whether yeah. that building or that garage that was built, you know, do we have to look back in the assessor's cards to see? I mean, there's administrative hang-ups to, to that, but I was just saying there, there are ways that are more defensible in court um, there's a black and white line, um, and as time goes by, more buildings will move into historic because we have declared anything more than 50 years old as historic. And but some things may not actually been listed or even as contributing, and they could be over 50 years old. Right, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the point. That's so yeah. I don't see that's, how an age is going to be the right bar. The, the, um, the, the, the 50 years was developed by the National Register to say this is when you start looking at a building looking for historic. It's yes. not, it's not, doesn't say when you hit that 50 year mark, you're historic. It says you should look at the building because it may be. A, a lot of our non-contributing are more than 50 years old. Uh, to, to answer a little bit yeah. of your question, the National Register update was original, originally the register was done in 77, 78. There were some updates through the 80s mm -hmm. uh, and it just was completed two years ago. So it sounds like, yeah, so, so so like a 20-year it, gap. It's not, it, it's, it's not going to happen again for a while. For a 30 uh, one of the things the Historic Preservation Commission is looking at is having a plan for adding to the state register, the national register, sections of, this, of, of the city. The feds have said the national register district in Montpelier is too big. You can't add to it anymore. 630 buildings or something. Mm -hmm. but. You know, if you start thinking about areas that could be added, look at the meadow, College Street. Now, boundaries have to be set. It's one of the difficulties in Montpelier is that neighborhoods sort of blend into each other with buildings. So to say, here it is. But we're working on developing a plan to do that. But that plan is not going to be carried out for 20 yeah. years if it's lucky. Is it possible to add every like every few years to add a few buildings to the state mm. register? It would be, uh, and that's one of the things. Being a CLG, the state has a grant program that the city has to match okay. it, but usually can match it with donated uh, uh, time from city staff. But that's exactly the plan to say, okay, you know, what do we want to do? We want to put this on the state register, much easier than the national register. Uh, you know, just to have a plan to do that. Uh, uh, in, in like an incremental fashion. In incremental fashion, exactly, because uh, 
it, 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 you couldn't accomplish it. I, I, my guess is that less than half the historic buildings are in Montpelier are actually in the National Register District. Yeah. But all you got to do is get into the state register and then it qualifies for protections yeah. under yeah. this ordinance. As, as long as, long as really it's also idea. in the design review district. As long right. as it's already in yeah. Right. Which, yeah. Okay, so we're out of time. Um, so we're going to have to, we'll, we'll tackle this more fully next time as, as something that, that we'll do, but although we've, we've discussed it quite a bit. Uh, one last piece I'd like to just mention is that we didn't get to the map, so I'd like to ask uh, the DRC uh, and the HPC uh, to put. It, first of all, will they will they meet before our next meeting? I don't think they were. They they've stayed out of the the lines on the map question. I think. So well, I shouldn't give them the opportunity. Or I'll let you maybe uh, fill in. I mean, there there might be. I don't have yeah. any committee or commission wide comments. I think okay. any comments you got on the map would be so, member so specific. I, I'm just I'm asking if they do meet before our next meeting, uh, if if inclined, please feel free to send us in writing comments on the map we've proposed so far, because we'll be voting next week and we'll be sending it along. Does that make sense? Does that work? All right. Now the historic preservation. I, my impression that the. You get me. Sorry. Uh -huh. That's my exit. <laughs> uh, uh, my impression was that we were actually going to sit down together with the Planning Commission and look at those boundaries with the Historic Preservation Commission. So in, in that case, uh, please come to our next meeting because we'll be yep. doing that. And uh, I, what I want to do is sort of drive the change. The one change I can really think of right now is taking that section and Sabin's Pastures off that's now owned by the um, uh, owned by the college so it's exempt anyway but but uh, the new owner is proposing some significant development there and okay. it's also a gateway so so in that case yeah please come to our next yeah. meeting and give a comments then um, I, I'd love time. another meeting <laughs> okay <Yeah. laughs> so do we yeah <laughs> your next meeting isn't next week is it? so okay. so Yes. So that's the next week. Not the day, right? That's the November 12th. So no, so no, yeah, no that the tentatively it's going to be a Tuesday. Yeah. Did you get that, Eric? I think that's HPC's actually November meeting. Is there next week? So oh, well, that could work out very well then. Yeah. Have a combined meeting? No, we have a combined meeting. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Well, it might just be HPC attends here. Okay. That's great. That's great. Okay. Uh, and I mean, just a heads up. We'll also talk about the. We'll be talking about the regs too. But um, hopefully, we'll get through those quickly. All right. So with that, we will. Uh, do we have a motion for adjournment? Thank you very much.